The human face, it makes us who we are. It is the centre of our senses, and as such, it is vital in the way we communicate. But not what you think. Yes, we use our mouths to talk, but our faces are much more than that for broadcasting our thoughts and feelings. Just one look at a person's expression can tell you so much about the emotional state of the individual. A smile, a frown, a scowl, each one can tell you how to interact with someone. Although this is something we take for granted as a natural part of the human condition, some scientists have looked to categorise and study our facial expressions. One such study took place in 1924, and in order to create genuine reactions in its test subjects, various stimuli were used, which would bizarrely culminate in the participants being asked to behead a rat in order to track their facial expressions. My name is John, and today we're looking at the 1924 facial expression experiment. Welcome to the dark side of science. Carly Landis was born on the 11th of January 1897 in West Alexandria, Ohio, a small town with a population of around 700 at the end of the 19th century. Carney would attend State University, where he majored in psychology, graduating in 1921. Study would not end for Landis, however, when he gained his master's a year later from Dartmouth College in 1922. This was whilst he was working as a psychology instructor. Upon completion of his master's, Landis moved to the University of Minnesota to study for his doctorate. During his education, Landis read various scientific studies into facial expressions, one of which was Darwin's The Expression of the Emotions of Man and Animals, his third book in his series of works on evolution. The book looks to delve into emotions of humans and animals alike, and features multiple pictures of faces in various different emotional states. For the animal kingdom, Darwin shows various expressive movements of dogs, cats, horses, ruminants and monkeys. He visualises various facial expressions in the book, showing joy, affection, pain, anger, astonishment and terror. The book also has photographs and illustrations of human faces in various states of emotion, from happiness to fear and anger. The book was originally released in 1872, with a second edition compiled by Darwin's son in 1890, and this was likely the version that Landis studied. One of the other main works that Carney took inspiration from was R. Schultz's Experimental Psychology and Pedagogy, released translated into English in 1912. This work touches on facial expressions and looks at the links between psychology and education. There are a number of different photographs of subjects' reactions to different stimuli, but it doesn't seek out to find the reason why. The final, and probably the work that Carney would take as a basis for his later experiments, was Herbert Langfield's The Judgment of Emotions from Facial Expressions, in 1918. This study would take place at Harvard's Psychological Laboratory. Langfield made use of six subjects, four men and two women, and showed each person 105 images of an illustration made from a photograph of an actor's face. Each expression was meant to convey a certain emotion. After being shown the image, the subject was then required to write down their interpreted emotion. Landis thought that this experiment had a problem though, and that was because of the authenticity of the expression of the actor. The results from the Langfield experiment were pretty interesting however. Although the study was not unique in finding that we can judge emotion from a picture, I mean look at artwork in general from history, you can tell we can understand emotion from a still image of a facial expression. But it did find that the general consensus from his six subjects was that each picture conveyed a particular emotion. Even the more subjective images that contained subtle emotional state cues, such as half crying and laughing. In post-experiment interviews, each subject was asked where do they look first when judging a facial expression. And interestingly, each gave slightly different answers. For example, one person stated they stared at the mouth first 
and another saying that they try to imagine themselves with that expression and how it would make them feel. Of course, modern day eye tracking experiments are more reliable at seeing what we look at first, but Langfield's experiment is interesting to see the thought processes of the subjects as they examine the images presented to them. Landis would achieve his PhD in 1924, and it quickly led him into the experiment that would put his name down in infamy. Landis took from the books and papers he had studied and saw a question unanswered. What is one's facial expression when exposed to real-world stimuli? Schultz's experimental psychology and pedagogy did touch on this by giving children bitter, sour and sweet-tasting items and photographed their expressions. However, Landis wanted to go deeper. He wanted to see if there was universal expressions for certain stimuli. Landis started off with his studies of emotional reactions, a preliminary study of facial expression in mid-1924. He made use of 19 test subjects, all men from Dartmouth College. The experiment was set up in a regular laboratory room. In order to record the facial expressions, Landis had access to a motion picture and ordinary still producing cameras. Landis had a specially constructed table behind which the subject was seated. This was placed in the centre of his setup. In a wall eight feet from the subject in front of him, several small openings were cut through which cameras were focused. Before the experiment would begin, Landis said to the subject, I'm making a study of facial expressions. All you have to do is to be seated behind the table and act as naturally as possible in the various situations that follow. Don't try to be emotional or show a poker face. Try to forget the cameras and act natural. Various stimuli from nine categories were presented to each subject and after each situation, a card was given to the participant with a number of emotions written on it, such as boredom, abstraction, dreamy, indifference, interest, also a space labelled feelings other than those mentioned. Each situation, however, would have a slightly different card. The experiment stimuli started off pretty tame, culminating in a fairly harsh finale. First off was classical music, a phonographic reproduction of Die Valkyrie by Wagner. Around a quarter of the subjects indicated interest, with the remaining showing indifference or boredom. Landis noted of the facial expression of a vacant stare in most. In the similar vein, the second stimuli was jazz music, a phonographic reproduction of My Man. The majority of the subjects indicated a rhythmic feeling, with around a quarter indicating boredom or indifference. This was shown on the facial expression, with 12 cracking a smile, and the opposite for the remainder of the subjects. The third stimulus was this time visual, with Giorgione's Sleeping Venus and Bulgiero's Birth of Venus. Both images are of unclothed women. Most indicated sex appeal and aesthetic appreciation, with remaining indicating indifference. The facial expressions are shown to be smiling or smirking. For the fourth stimulus, they were shown paintings of Christ, and the facial expressions were mainly of a frown, which correlated with most indicating sadness, religious feelings or indifference. From the fifth stimulus all the way to the ninth, things started to get a little bit more cruel, starting with vulgar pictures of direct sex appeal. A strip of pictures depicting various adult acts was used. The subjects recorded disgust, repulsion, sex appeal and feelings of absurdity and grotesque. The facial expressions were a mixture of smirking all the way to pure disgust. But interestingly, each subject let out a noticeable gasp when shown the stimuli. The sixth stimulus were pictures to arouse horror or disgust. Illustrations in The Diseases of China by Jeffries and Maxwell were used. I've looked at the book and it is pretty upsetting with some of the images within. Interestingly, because some of the participants were medical students, a high number indicated professional interest, with the second highest being pity. 
The expression shown is most indicated by a frown and a closed mouth. Number seven on the list was odours. This consisted of eight small bottles with various smelling dilute forms of cinnamon oil, spirits of peppermint and others. But the final was the actual interesting item. The bottle was marked syrup of lemon but actually contained ammonia. Needless to say, the reactions to the sweet smelling items resulted in generally happy expressions. But the shock of the ammonia yielded an instant reaction of disgust, followed by a small smile. The penultimate stimulant was a bucket filled with frogs. Each subject was told to put their hand inside and feel around. Instantly a reaction of disgust was recorded until they were allowed to look inside, when most showed signs of relief and even a small smile. The final stimuli seemed to be the most cruel. It too involved a bucket. It had around 6 inches of water inside and the subject was told with his right hand to hold onto a metal rod and with his left hand to feel around in the bucket. There was an induction coil placed in the bucket. As soon as the hand touched it, the circuit was complete and the subject received a substantial electric shock. All of the subject's expressions immediately went to surprise and in the questionnaire most indicated surprise and pain. Landis had discovered that he could generate more accurate facial expressions with his initial experiment, but he felt like improvements could be made and set about planning the next step in his deep dive into expression. He didn't manage to see any universal expression for any of the stimuli as most of the subjects showed a whole range of slight differences, even including smiling during some of the more shocking situations. Maybe a bigger experiment with more people would help. Taking what he learnt from the earlier 1924 study, he wanted to create ever more real emotional disturbances and record the facial expressions generated. Furthermore, Landis wanted to make use of as many distinct forms of reaction as possible, culminating in significant emotional upset. Instead of the nine stimulus categories from the first experiment, he upped it to 17, and some went well beyond the boundary of ethical. Also different in the second experiment was that women would be part of the study, as well as recording of blood pressure. 25 subjects would be used, consisting of 12 men, 12 women, and oddly, one male child. Another part that Landis criticised of his original study was that of the setting. You see, he felt that the previous setup felt too much like a laboratory. Well, it was, but that it might have coloured the reactions from his subjects as they were always aware of the experimental nature of the situation they were in. This time around, he sought out to make the experimental room more homely. The walls were redecorated, drapes were placed at the window, and several paintings were hung on the walls, so that the final effect gave a minimal suggestion of a laboratory. This time around, the subjects were seated comfortably at the table. Behind stood a large screen which served as a photographic background. At either side of the subject stood a 1000 watt lamp in a diffusing reflector. With this, illumination was possible to take better photographs at any time. A second room was used to house all the equipment, including the camera, which shot images through a small hole in the wall facing the subject. A speaking tube and buzzer was provided between the two rooms, so that the experimenter in the subject's room could keep the assistant who was handling the apparatus in step with the procedure. Each subject before the experiment had a front and profile photo taken and then to assist with facial studying after the experiment, each subject had their faces marked with black lines to highlight certain muscle groups. Then another photograph, both front on and in profile were taken with a grid placed over the camera to assist with later measuring. Every movement of the head was judged after each stimuli and notes were made on every visual change of each subject's face. Each participant during the study would be subjected to roughly a three hour ordeal and much like Landis's previous study, each stimuli would increase in severity. But the whole experiment was much better choreographed in order to keep the subject guessing and thus hopefully generate a more genuine reaction to the stimulus. Well, I've spoken around it enough. 
let's actually look at the 1924 facial expression study. As I mentioned before, the number of stimuli was increased over the earlier study, and as such, there was some crossover between both experiments. And this was because Landis reused some of the situations. However, he did modify them to achieve a greater reaction. The experiment would start off with the participant signing a slip, stating that they would not divulge any information about the situations they will be exposed to. Then the subject would be led into the experiment room by an experimenter, who in most cases would be Landis himself for the men and a female assistant for the women. The aforementioned control photographs were taken and the faces would be marked up. Now, ready, the first stimuli would begin. The first two situations were music. That was aimed to calm any nerves of the participants. For the first 10 minutes, the music was the pop music of the day, jazz. This disarmed the subjects, but things would ramp up in the second section when more complex technical music was played. This was marked by their virtuosity and technique, almost having no melody. Photographs and blood pressure measurements were taken. This would be for every section, although the images would be taken at the closest moment to the reveal of the stimuli. The next section brought an interesting subject into the mix, and that was being requested to read St. Luke 6, 18-49 out of the Bible. This required the participant to pick from two pieces of paper with a letter printed on it, a T for truth or L for lie. If L was selected, points of circumstantial evidence attaching the participant to some crime were written on. They were then meant to invent a lie which would clear them of the charges on a cross-examination with the experimenter. If T was chosen, then an alibi was provided for the crime. This situation was used to try and induce anxiety and lengthen the total time of the experiment, as well as assert the experimenter's dominance. This is another carrier cross from the early experiment again. Again, like before, having several bottles with nice smelling fluids within, with the last having ammonia mislabeled again as lemon syrup. Situation 5 would be the first taste of Landis's now trademark of misdirection in order to get a more natural reaction. Landis continues his misleading antics by having the experimenter say the subject had smudged the marks on their face, and as such, they would need to reapply them. The experimenter would then go behind the screen. This would be the point they would signal to the other room to get ready for photographs and blood pressure readings. The experimenter then lit and set off a firecracker under the subject's chair. Needless to say, this yielded a shocked expression from the participant. Although shocking, it has so far been a harmless type of diversion, not much more than a high school prank. This one is more bizarre. The subject was given a sheet of paper and a pencil and told to write a full description of the meanest or most contemptible or most embarrassing thing they ever did. As soon as they were finished, the experimenter would then read aloud this confession. Again, embarrassment and anxiety was the aim of the game here. Strangely, Landis wanted to see if he could make a universal joke to invoke a laugh. But this section was promptly removed after the second participant shrugged off the apparent humorous quip. This section, much like the previous experiment, showed pretty unpleasant pictures of various diseases, but this time from the book Atlas de Haut Crankhurten. Do yourself a favour and don't look it up. I did and it put me off my dinner. This again seemed a bit like a padding exercise like the truth or lie section 4, but involved distracting the participant whilst they undertook mental arithmetic. Frustration and annoyance were the name of the game here, but it also helped cement the authority of the experimenter as they would hold the subject until they got a correct answer. Naughty pictures. Much like before, these were intended to elicit a shock response, 
with the experimenter insisting that the subject look these over carefully. The pictures were of an illicit nature. Don't forget that these people were from the 1920s and would have probably have had a greater shock value. Much like the previous situation and involving nudity again, it consisted of posed photographs of feminine artists' models. Again, the experimenter would insist on the subject thoroughly looking at the images. Some of the most salubrious excerpts from the book Psychology of Sex were presented to the participants and again were instructed to read thoroughly. Again, this was another part taken from the previous experiment. But Landis up the ante once again. He combined this with the electric shock stimuli. The participant would be told to put their hand in the bucket and after touching the frogs and reacting, the experimenter would then say, feel longer, you've missed something. The hand would feel until it touched the electric coil. The coil would discharge a shock. Again, photographs and blood pressure readings would ensue. Although seemingly cruel, the next part is arguably why we are here talking about this experiment in the first place. The table in front of the subject had been covered with a cloth for the 15th scenario. The cloth was removed, revealing a tray and a butcher's knife. The experimenter then brought out a live rat. The instructions were simple but unbelievable. Hold this rat with your left hand and then cut off its head with the knife. 21 of the subjects were given this instruction. Some willingly performed the execution with little prompting. Others offered some resistance, but after continued orders from the experimenter, would eventually capitulate. 15 in total would comply with the authority figure and execute the beheading. Five who would completely refuse would then have to witness the experimenter perform the task themselves. One of the subject's beheadings, as Landis would later note in his paper, for various reasons was not performed. Little did he know, but Landis had stumbled upon inventing a behavioural study of obedience, some 40 years before the infamous Milgram experiment. Clearly, Landis found electric shocks to be pretty handy in psychological experimentation, as he managed to wrangle it in again. The subject's arm was connected to an armband and a stethoscope. Both of these were attached to an inductorium. The subject was given a card which had two numbers printed on it and told to multiply these mentally while they received electrical distraction. The electric shocks were increased and decreased in order to wear the subject down. Landis would later write, This situation, following the long grind of the other situations, brought about a very real disturbance. The electric shocks continued either in Landis's own words, some very real emotion expression was given, or it was apparent that the subject would not give away any marked expression. Which makes you wonder how long this would have gone on for. Only one person was actually able to correctly answer the multiplication question. This one is also a little bit cruel. The experimenter would step behind a curtain and make some loud noises, as though preparing for another situation. After enough stress was exerted on the subject, the experimenter would step out and say, well, that finishes it, just as soon as we get the final blood pressure and respiration records, you are through. The final situation was to see the effects of sudden relief after a period of stress. The experiment generated tremendous amounts of data, hundreds of observations and around 711 photographs to sift through. Landis and his assistant started working their way through each photo, discounting any that did not show any discernible reaction. After sifting through all the data, Landis settled on a 17 point summary of the experiment and it was a real mixed bag. He concluded that he did see a difference between the genders in their reaction to the same stimuli. He claimed that men were more animated than their female counterparts. He categorised the main facial expressions to pain, surprise, anger, exasperation, crying, disgust, sexual excitement and revolting. 
but did not see any uniform reaction across all the subjects. And essentially the study failed to meet one of its key questions, if there were certain facial expressions for each emotion, but there was not. We are after all individuals, and the way we react to things, unsurprisingly, is individual. But Landis's results were not really the most important part of the experiment. It was his unknowing discovery which has gone down in history. The setup of an experimenter and an experimentee inadvertently led the study down the path of showing the human condition of obedience of authority. 15 out of the 21 beheaded the rat, something that many people I'm sure even in 1924 thought to be a severe action. Not something many would be willing to do, be it on moral grounds or just from being squeamish. But someone with authority nudging them was all that was needed to end a poor rodent's life. This is where the ethical concerns also come into play, as it could be considered animal cruelty to kill for no other reason than to kill. Even the deaths of the rats weren't swift. In Landis's notes, he said, the effort and attempt to hurry usually resulted in a rather awkward and prolonged job of decapitation. Another big criticism comes from the fact the participants were essentially exposed to some low-level psychological torture, with the writing down secrets, electric shocks, animal murder, and scaring them with unexpected loud noises. Unsurprisingly, the most striking photos were from the shock and surprise situations. Using a male experimenter for the male participants and a female for the female participants also makes the results problematic. Really, there needed to be a control group and a much larger study group. Nearly all the participants were from a university background and did not represent a good section of society. Also, and on top of all those concerns, it was seemingly like Landis wanted to break almost every ethical issue. He even had one child participant, which brings up the problem for just this one subject of informed consent. Needless to say, Carney Landis and his experiment has aged to history like a fine one pint bottle of milk. This period in history was a bit of a wild west for psychiatry experiments, with the Baby Albert experiment just four years earlier in 1920, and the Gaia and Donald experiment just after in the early 1930s. The animal and human cruelty elements of this study definitely wouldn't get past the board nowadays, and the experiment didn't really further the study of emotions much. The controversial experiment did not, however, affect Landis's career, where he would release multiple papers and books, even interestingly speaking out about the issues with psychosurgery. He would spend most of his career working at Columbia University from 1932 to his retirement in 1959, but sadly he wouldn't enjoy his retirement for too long, as he would die in 1962. 